Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is May 9, 2021. And in this video, we're going to be critiquing Kyle Kalinske talking about socialism. This one was sent in by a viewer. Let's get into the video. This clip is special, and Greg Gutfeld is very special needs. So he um, is going to make this point about pff, people don't even know what socialism is nowadays, and it's really fucking dumb. And right after he says that, he goes on to show he's one of the people who doesn't really know anything about socialism. Watch. Um, the, here's, the problem with, <laughs> here's the problem with this debate. It's not the 1980s anymore. If you call something socialism, it's not going to persuade a population that has no idea what it means. No one's being educated anymore about socialism. They don't know anything about USSR. They haven't read any history books or world history on socialism. They don't know what it means. So cradle to grave government actually sounds pretty good. It's like, wow, that's awesome. That means the government's going to be with me until I die. I don't have to worry about anything. And the thing is, the reason why they think that way, and it's natural, is because no one's explained to them succinctly the trade-offs. Obviously, this comes with a price. And you need to tell them, okay, if you turn everything over to government, number one, you can't afford it. The country goes broke. And when there's an emergency, number two, let's say like a war, your military will be uh, will be hogtied. Uh, you, the goods and services will not meet the standards of private industry. So what you pay for, i.e. Amtrak or the mail, is nothing like what FedEx could do. So it all over time goes to hell in terms of quality. The individual is less inclined to um, achieve greatness if they know if they don't have to they're still gonna, gonna get a free meal and a free x and a free y you don't have to work so hard and then lastly you just run out of rich people right because, because either they go fro they go broke or they leave okay so before kyle gets into his thoughts i'm gonna get into mine and then we'll listen to his and then we'll try to settle the difference basically this clip was sent in by a viewer who framed it as Kyle tries to school someone on what socialism is, but unfortunately doesn't know what it is either. And knowing Kyle Kalinske, I think that that is entirely possible and likely. So let's just start with a quick note. Calling Greg Gutfield special needs. Let's just maybe not say those kinds of things. Anyway, getting into Greg Gutfield, uh, talking about people aren't educated about socialism. Was anyone in the U.S. ever educated about socialism that didn't have to go like miles and miles out of their regular life course to actually get educated on it? He means propagandized. I mean, has Fox News ever educated anyone about anything? To the extent anyone has been educated about socialism in the United States, it certainly didn't come from the fanatical far right such as Fox News. So he starts, this isn't point one, it's the last note. He starts by talking about cradle-to-grave government. That is how Fox News presents socialism to its audience, is that it's just literally, you know, the more government you have, the more socialist it is. That is not correct. If I were to try to correct that in one phrase, I would say socialism is a different mode of production than capitalism not just a different amount of government or a different type of government. It is a different situation regarding who controls and owns industry. That is the basic difference between capitalism and socialism. In capitalism, a small ruling class of capitalists controls most of the institutions of society, whether it's education, religion, the government, etc., in socialism, the working class, people who do not personally own industry, control the institutions of society. That is the difference. It is a difference in the ruling class, not just the amount of government or the type of government. However, the traditional form of socialism, particularly in the 20th century, is a situation where the old capitalist state was destroyed and then the Workers' Party, a Marxist party, created a new government for workers, of workers involved with the party, overseeing and guiding the production and distribution of goods and services so that a modern standard of living could be implemented and enacted. We have, under capitalism, also industry. However, it is not governed democratically at all. It's governed by a very small percentage of the population 
who privately own industry and operate it in whatever way they think is going to be profitable. Sometimes it lines up with human needs. Sometimes it doesn't. It's wasteful. It's chaotic. It's manipulative. It's exploitative towards the vast majority of people who live in that society. So it's not just a question of how much government do you have. This is where people wind up with the misconception of like any country that has a strong state is socialist. And the stronger it is, the more socialist it is. And if it's real strong, it's communism. That is where people get this misconception from. It's not true. Hopefully that provides some clarity. Now let's move on to points one through five. Point number one, you can't afford it. Well, I can't afford anything right now. I just spent personally the last 10 years working my ass off and uh, that included school, work opportunities that I thought would, you know, build my resume, etc. I literally am having exactly as much trouble getting jobs today as I was before I did all of that 10 years ago. So I took time out of my life to improve my skills and experience and knowledge. And then in 2019, before the pandemic started... I had a period of unemployment in which I sent out 120 resumes and wound up working in a grocery store with a master's degree in an employable quote-unquote field. But it's just not the way the economy works or doesn't work. Also on this point, he mentions the country goes broke. Anyway, he doesn't talk about any of you know, there's no there's no evidence cited. He doesn't give any examples. This is just supposed to be taken as a truism. And do we have to listen to points that don't have supporting evidence? No, we don't. You ask for the evidence. If it's not supplied, probably they just made it up. Okay, continuing on to point two. Emergencies. <laughs> this was great, where he goes, your military uh, will be hogtied. So if... I don't even know what to say. I, I, honestly, I don't understand the point he was making about how how is this tied into socialism? Is it because the country has, quote, gone broke? So first of all, if there's one thing the USA doesn't need, it's more war or military. Uh, he's talking about the U.S. military being hogtied. The U.S. has hundreds of military bases around the world. It's currently subjugating, like, the majority of the planet. He couldn't take his own point seriously. It's like he was reading it off the paper like somebody else wrote it for him. And he's like, ah, I can't really read this in good conscience, can I? What, what tiny conscience he has. What tiny amount of intellectual honesty he has. Or hey, maybe it's just even vanity. Maybe he just doesn't want to sound like a complete fraud. <laughs> that's possible. I mean, something of a fraud, you know, that's to be allowed and expected, but you just can't go full fraud. Point number three, goods and services will not meet the standards of private industry. The example, Amtrak or the mail is nothing like what FedEx could do. So, um, yeah, actually what happened with FedEx is they took the profitable portions, package services, of the mail service and privatized them. Do you think FedEx wants to do letter delivery? Do you think that it, letter delivery is ever going to be profitable? Do you think that FedEx is going to let you put a 50 cent stamp on a piece of mail and mail it out to like rural Idaho where there's like dirt roads leading up to the address? No, they are not because that is not profitable and it never will be. However, what they did was they took a well-developed service, USPS, and then they gave the profitable parts to UPS and FedEx and DHL and whatever else exists now. Then they also took U USPS and they made it so that they have to pre-fund pensions for many, many, many years in advance, something private companies don't, you know, their competitors ostensibly don't have to do. And all of this is commonly cited as evidence that USPS is failing, etc. We just saw major attacks on the post office under Donald Trump, major overt attacks. 
This is something the Republican Party, represented here by Fox News, is crazy about. They really want to privatize mail. I guarantee you, if they ever succeed, God forbid, anything that is not profitable is going to just fall by the wayside so fast. Let me also point out, USPS is unionized. It's not the world's greatest union, but it is unionized. So is UPS. There are problems there, but it is unionized. FedEx is cheaper. It is not unionized. Let's just be clear about the world Greg Gutfeld wants. Maximal liberty for capitalists with really nothing standing in their way, whether it's organized workers, whether it's liberal capitalists trying to raise the bar on what the standards are in running a business. They want no restrictions at all. So also, just saying Amtrak or the mail is nothing like what FedEx could do. You have any evidence? What are you talking about? Nothing. All right, just runs through this list. Point number four, the individual is less inclined to achieve greatness if they know they don't have to, meaning they're still going to get a free meal and a, quote, free X and a free Y, and you don't have to work so hard. Well, I'll come back to the earlier point. Let's just talk about working so hard. People in the U.S. already work harder under worse conditions and for more hours per week than in what people do in any comparable country. It's, this is not a virtue. It's a sign of a system that's overtaxing its people. And people are doing that because it's necessary to survive. It's increasingly difficult to make ends meet at all on any level without falling into homelessness, food insecurity, etc., The amount that people are getting paid is just not enough to live on, period. Wages, salaries are too low. They are not keeping up with prices at all. They also are completely divorced from productivity. So all that wealth is going to the top while people work longer hours under worse conditions. That's indefensible, period. He sidesteps it completely. Well, actually... I guess you could say he tries to justify it by saying putting people in this bind makes them strive for greatness. First of all, does class mobility exist? Not really. Not to anywhere near the extent they would like you to think. Also, to the extent that any kind of mobility, like there's just nowhere to go. There's nowhere to advance. You can work and work and work. It's not going to get you anywhere. Maybe you just, you know, struggle to survive a little bit more successfully. You can afford that one extra consumer good. But it's you, you, you never get to rest. If you can't rest, relax, and enjoy your life, what's the point of living? You're just being worked to death. There isn't room at the top. It's harder than ever to open a small business. or like all these carrots that they used to dangle in promotion of the American dream. You know, the, this system. It used to be like, oh, you can be middle class, you can own your own little thing. That's harder than ever. We're going through a retail apocalypse that used to be a big uh, stepping stone towards being middle class was owning your business. That's harder to do than ever because, you know, you can't like, it's pretty hard to open a factory, for example, requires a lot of capital. People would oftentimes be retailers. They would resell what other people made at a markup. That's where's the room for that? <laughs> Amazon and Walmart and everything else. I mean, they've put people out of business. That's, that was the 90s and the 2000s and last decade. It's done. It's done. There's no room. So these are really outdated talking points. Um, you know, And just the idea of people striving for greatness, never mind that the overwhelming majority won't be able to achieve it because there's just nowhere to go in that regard, uh, that that somehow justifies these Poor conditions in the overwork. It does not. Point five, you run out of rich people because they go broke or they leave. Well, what is the need for rich people? What is the need? Um, Rich people don't make money. Like they don't shit it out of their asses. We don't need them. They're not a resource. Rich people are defined by the fact that they're hoarding resources that they can't possibly use personally. That really would be better used if distributed to the rest of society who actually are experiencing a lack of those things. Um, 
there's no way this is what when we talk about private property from a marxist perspective particularly with regard to industry we're talking about possessions that people keep as their private property that capitalists keep that they can't possibly use personally like one person one capitalist cannot personally use a factory or even a restaurant that has to be shared for it to be operated successfully for it to work therefore when we say the abolition of private property we mean abolishing a situation where people can own things privately that are not personal private property that they can't possibly use on a personal private basis so as far as running out of rich people I fail to see where he demonstrated the need for them in the first place. And let me just say, the very fact that we've reached a point in the United States where this kind of open billionaire worship is even tolerated, let alone where this is one of the most successful cable channels, is appalling. We got to do something about that. Those are my comments. Let's listen to Kyle. And then we will respond to Kyle. Literally every part of that was dead wrong. Every single part of that. Every part of that. So, I mean, you saw, he's a, people don't even understand what socialism is anymore. And then he goes on to show, he doesn't understand what socialism is. How are you going to talk about socialism and make that point and then you don't even provide a definition? You don't even provide a definition. Now, listen, you can define it in a number of different ways. Some would argue it's Marx's idea of, it's like, you know, the transitionary phase between capitalism and full communism. Some would say it's that. Others would say it's just workers owning the means of production and distribution. You know, some people consider social democracy to be flat socialists. Some people don't. But whatever. He says, people don't even know what socialism is anymore. And then he doesn't even provide a definition. How do you do that? Oh my God, it's, this is so crazy. It's so annoying having to break down these objectively shitty arguments. He says, it's not the 1980s anymore, so just saying socialism isn't going to work to turn people off to it. In other words, he's saying in the 1980s, all you had to do was say socialism and everybody would be like, yeah, that's terrible, we agree. So what he wants is a population that's massively propagandized. See, he says, I want you to think about it, I don't want you to d turn your brain off. But actually what he's arguing for, if you want to go back to the 1980s with the socialism discourse... You're arguing for more people turning their brains off and not thinking about it. That's what he wants. He wants everybody to be just scared and to shut their brain off when that, you know, boogeyman word comes up. And then he goes on to say, he, he the closest he gets to defining socialism is he says, cradle to grave government. And he says, hey, that sounds good to people. Yeah, you want to know why it sounds good to people? Because... The ways in which social democrats propose that, it is good. That's why it sounds good to people. Because it's not, the government takes over everything, that ridiculous straw man. No. It's the bare minimum basic necessities of life to even give people a shot at equal opportunity. That's why it sounds good. Because the things that we're talking about taking off the table for the people are reasonable things to take off the table for people. Um, he said, nobody has explained the trade-offs. If you turn everything over to the government, you can't afford it. Now, by the way, nonsense. He's arguing fundamentally against a, more of a social democratic system. And first of all, they don't turn everything over to the government. They simply don't do that. That's not true. And also, of course you can afford it. It's called raise taxes on the wealthy. Now, we'll get back to that point because he thinks he has an argument against that too, even though he doesn't. But of course you can afford it. And if you have your own sovereign currency, you don't even necessarily need to afford it. In other words, you can still deficit spend and be fine. He would argue against that too, but he would be wrong and history would prove him wrong. So the idea that you can't afford it is just such a cop-out. It's such a fucking cop-out. Because we always spend on things that we prioritize. For example, we prioritize Wall Street bailouts. We can afford it. We prioritize injecting $1.5 trillion in one day into financial institutions during the market downturn during COVID. We can afford it. We fucking did it. We did it. We just did it. We do the Wall Street bailouts. We do the endless military spending. Of course you can afford it. You can do whatever the fuck you want to do if you're a sovereign government. And that's what we are. So it's just a matter of what do you prioritize. Uh, then he says, oh, one of the downsides is that the military will be hogtied. The fuck are you talking about? So... 
it necessarily follows that you need to have a weak or non-existent military if you have social democratic programs. That's just not true. We already have some social democratic programs and we have a freakishly large military, which does need to be cut, by the way. But we have social security. We have Medicare. We have some government programs and we have a really strong military. Those things are not connected at all. You could either have a big military or a small military or something in the middle and you could either have social democratic programs or not. Those things aren't tied to each other at all. Okay, Kyle's about halfway through his comments. I'm going to jump in here, give my comments, let him finish, then comment again. So let me hone in, I think, on what the primary problem here is, is Kyle points out that Gutfeld is basically arguing against more of a social democratic system while calling it socialism. That's a good point. So Kyle is not arguing for socialism. Kyle is a social democrat. He has said so many times. So basically here you have an argument, obviously non-real-time, not indirect argument, between Greg Gutfeld arguing for neoliberal brutality, you know, unregulated capitalism with few, if any, social programs, and a social democrat, Kyle Kalinske, on the other hand, who wants more regulations, more social programs. Socialists basically never should have been paged in this entire discussion. The word socialism shouldn't have come up. However, it's part of the right-wing boogeyman ignorance tactic to call these things, really, they call anything that is not unrestricted laissez-faire capitalism, socialism. Like, if there is a law regarding business, to them it's socialism. And that way they can inoculate their fearful audience against any kind of change whatsoever as being, quote, socialism. Never mind what socialism is, if it's different from social democracy or not. Um, you know, so basically what we have here is an argument between a total neoliberal and a social democrat. Uh, the word socialism never should have come up. I mean, I agree with most of Kyle's points here. Uh, you know, taking starvation off the table is what social democrats are trying to do uh, in order to create what he calls, quote, the basic necessities for equal opportunity. That's not really what we're looking for as socialists, but let's not play debate bro definition time. Actual socialism, as implemented in history, takes different courses. There are general aims and general trends and general theories a little different every time it's implemented, though. One thing that we definitely can do is distinguish it from social democracy or welfare capitalism. Some social democrats, as we currently understand that term, people who want regulated capitalism with strong social welfare programs. Some social democrats want an eventual transition away from capitalism entirely. Some do not. I believe that Kyle Kalinske is in the latter. He does not want an eventual transition away from capitalism. That's a transition that we Marxists understand is inevitable. It has to happen. Capitalism, even regulated capitalism, even Keynesian capitalism that we had during the middle part of the 20th century started getting rolled back in the 80s and, and onward in neoliberalism. Even that kind of regulated capitalism, it needs ever more regulation because capitalism contains fatal, fundamental contradictions within it, which, as time goes on, destroy it from within. It creates a gigantic class of working people called proletarians who do not have the slightest interest in maintaining the private property system which exploits them, and at a certain point, all that society consists of is proletarians. It creates its own destruction. I mean, this is apart from just how unstable it is as the basis of your economy. So capitalism was able to squeak through the 20th century with lots of regulations gluing it together and lots of programs offsetting some of the inequality that it was necessarily creating. However, for the last 40 years, what we call neoliberalism, an attempt to go back to unregulated classical liberalism. They've been taking off all those protections and things that was keeping it together, and it's getting really unstable again. 
Hence, social Democrats like Kyle Kalinske, uh, really like a lot of people in the center and right of the Bernie Sanders coalition, have been popping back up saying, hey, let's go back to the 70s. Let's do what we were doing then. We can put the glue back on, etc. At best, you can call these people who want an eventual transition to capitalism a kind of opportunist, anti-revolution socialist. But a lot of these people don't even want, they, they want to keep that system indefinitely. They are under the illusion that they can keep that system indefinitely. You cannot. It's going to need, if your system is going to hold together, more and more regulations until it necessarily isn't capitalism anymore. And people are going to fight that process. And anyway, just, just go for socialism. Let's get back to the comments. Uh, and then he says, the goods and services provided won't be as good as the private sector. In some, in some specific industries, I think that's true. But in a lot of the industries that we're talking about nationalizing or socializing, he's just wrong. Like, for example, the healthcare system in Canada and the healthcare system in the UK is way better than the healthcare system here. And we have a private healthcare system. They have a totally public healthcare system in the UK. Theirs beats ours. So it's not a matter of like, government bad, private sector good. It's a matter of the specifics and the logistics and how well it's managed and who's in control. That's what it comes down to. It has nothing to do with, you know, private sector good, public sector bad, or public sector good, private sector bad. It all depends on the specifics, but he just wants to be a sloppy thinker and say the goods and services won't be as good. Um, and then finally he says, the individual is less inclined to achieve greatness and work hard, and there's going to be fewer rich people. We know that's not true. And by the way, did Sweden run out of rich people? Did any of the Scandinavian countries run out of rich people? Did even like Australia or the UK, did they run out of rich people for being further left on the spectrum than us and more social democratic than us? Is that what happened? No, it didn't happen. You're going to run out of rich people. I mean, that's just, that's an old trope that's always as dumb as it sounds. And even to the idea that, oh, if you have some sort of social democracy or some socialist-like system, the individual is less inclined to achieve greatness and work hard. We just saw the results of a UBI study in California, Stockton, California. And you know what they found? Literally, when you give people money, when you give people money, they spend it on the most important things, the most reasonable things, the most rational things. They spend it on rent. They spend it on their electric bill. They spend it on food. It, it, they spent it in a very responsible way. So if you give people the bare minimums, they don't check out. The overwhelming majority of people are going to say, okay, great, now I have some bare minimums. Now let me continue to go out there and try to make the most of myself and the best of myself and try to be successful and try to do things that are fulfilling. It's not going to make you less inclined to work hard or achieve greatness. We learned from that UBI study, among others, when you give people support for the bare minimums, they're like, great, now I can take a deep breath and I have a little bit more cushion to go out there and, and do what's best for myself and my family. So he's just wrong. And the, I will never get over the irony of people don't even understand what socialism is. And then he goes on to show he doesn't understand. Didn't even provide a definition. Didn't even provide a wrong definition. Never mind a definition. People don't understand what socialism is. And so now I'm going to say it's, I guess, cradle to grave government. And socialism is when you can't afford it. And when the military is hogtied and the goods and services suck. And when the individual is less inclined to achieve greatness. And socialism is when you run out of rich people. I don't know how anybody watches this and thinks it's good, but there are some people out there. Okay, so that's the end of the video. And yeah, of course, the irony is he's basically doing the exact same thing that he's accusing the other guy of doing. Um, again, this was a, an argument between a, an avowed social Democrat and a right-wing Republican about s socialism, ostensibly, something they were calling socialism, but neither one of them was actually talking about it. They were both talking about social democracy which is what the ruling class of the United States really would like to limit the conversation to. They don't want, you know, Kyle at the beginning made a few comments about some would say that socialism is Marx's idea of the transitionary phase between capitalism and communism. 
He was visibly uncomfortable talking about this. I guarantee you, if you pressed him to go into it, he wouldn't be able to go further. I thought at least he's trying, gave it a little bit of lip service. But really, it's about limiting the conversation to social democracy here. That's the key thing. That's one of the things we're trying to do at Socialism for All, to make socialist theory more accessible and digestible with commentary and discussion and tying it into current events. So anyway, getting back to Kyle, he says, in some specific industries, I think it's true that private goods and services are going to be higher quality. Well, okay, very sophisticated nuance, but where's the proof? Like, what are you talking about? Kyle also gives zero examples. He does give one example of a public service, healthcare in the UK and Canada, being of high quality and getting better results for people than in the US. But he goes along with this right-wing talking point of like, yeah, you know, the public sector isn't going to be as successful at producing goods and services of the same quality without any evidence or examples. He also says of Gutfeld, he wants to be a sloppy thinker. I think that's giving Gutfeld too much credit. Uh, It's probably just, you know, his phrasing was off. But Gutfeld doesn't want people to be a thinker at all. Unfortunately, Kyle is playing into it way too much with his style of commentary. I would have appreciated a much clearer statement up front from Kyle saying, hey, I'm a social democrat. I'm not a socialist. I don't even know what socialism is all about so much. I have confined my politics to social democracy. You know, I think that would have been a better disclaimer at the start. He did say it, I guess, a little bit, but it would have been nice to have that clearer for people in the, I mean, the context of the environment that we're in, where there's so much confusion. That's what the video is about, is how much confusion there is about all these terms. Okay, then we get into Scandinavia. And the UK and Australia are like further left wing than the United States. Look, capitalism is a right wing system. If you're still for capitalism in the 21st century, you're right wing. You might be center, you might be center right, you might be far right, but you are not on the left side of the political spectrum, period, by my standards. So in referencing Scandinavia, Kyle plays the same goalposts moving game that he rightfully points out that Gutfeld is playing. When he describes these countries as having, quote, some socialist type system, no, they don't. They have a capitalist type system. They are not trying to move away from capitalism. They are trying to keep their capitalism from falling apart. That's what they're trying to do. Lastly, final point, UBI, not a socialist proposal. UBI came out of a conservative libertarian, really, idea called the negative income tax. It was supposed to replace unemployment compensation, which capitalists felt was providing too much competition with wages. They wanted to get rid of that, having UBI as a substitute for it. I was suspicious of when Andrew Yang trotted this out because I remembered that Richard Nixon had been seriously considering UBI back in the 70s. This was the start of neoliberalism when the blueprints and the groundwork were starting to be discussed and formulated. And if you want to learn more about UBI from a Marxist perspective, go to Paul Cockshot's YouTube channel. He has a great like 20 minute video on the how and why of UBI not being socialist. And it actually just plays into the entire slump of neoliberalism, uh, trying to get around the conflict between capital and labor, and keep things very, very easy for capitalists. Kyle also, I'll just conclude by saying, really isn't questioning the inherent value of working hard, etc. He's like, UBI doesn't make people lazy, bro. I wouldn't care if it did. Why do we work so much? The vast majority of the time we spend working just makes some capitalist rich. We could work half as much in a system where that isn't the case, where our surplus value isn't getting pocketed, uh, we could work half as much making you know, far less surplus value over our necessary labor time and still achieve better development than we're achieving now. We don't have to work harder all the time. That's not what this is about. It's not about not working at all. It's about when we're not working for profit 
and we're not working at the direction of a capitalist. When we are directing more of our own labor, when we are less alienated from our own labor, etc., uh, and we're setting more of the conditions of our own work, what does that world look like? And at this point, we're completely rocketing out of the entire paradigm of talking about how many restrictions should there be in capitalism. You know, zero, according to the Fox News guy, or like many, according to Kyle, you're still in the same overall paradigm, which has far-reaching consequences, which are not purely economic. We're going to leave it there because this opens an entire other discussion, which we will address in another video. Thanks for listening. Thanks to our current patrons, whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. If that's not your thing, liking, sharing, subscribing always helps. If you have thoughts, leave a comment. I often reply to comments. Try to treat this as an actual exchange educational opportunity for everyone involved, including me. I thank you for your contributions and participation, and we'll see you in the next video.